everyone and welcome back to the Black Culture Matters podcast brought to you by Catch the Drip. I am Magat Wade, the founder and CEO of Skinny Skin, the lip balm on a mission. And you can find more at skinnyskin.com. And uh, here with me is Bishop, Jamar, is Bishop Omar Jawar, the founder and CEO of Urban Specialist. So this Black Culture Matters podcast is brought to you by Catch the Drip with Magat and Bishop Omar, a video show we host together where the cultural icons of our times share, um, you know, get to inspire young Black listeners to become the best versions of themselves, leading healthy, happy, and productive lives as co-creators of society by giving giving them the instructions and the knowledge they need to succeed. Find us on all social media platforms with the handle at Catch the Drip TV. Bishop, so good to see you again. Great intro. <laughs> Thank, <Okay>. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm still working on it, but you know, we're getting there. We're getting there. Like so Bishop, you ready? What did you say? You sound like a professional to me. Oh, good. I like the sound of that. I like the sound of that. Well, Bishop, today it's going to be, I hope you're ready because, you know, yesterday you left me with uh, 20 million questions in my mind. I was so excited by what we're talking about. I mean, those numbers you shared with us with, um, you know, the results that you're able to get through urban specialists and the OGs and what you're doing. So basically I went... After, the, after our session, I just have 20 million questions, like I said, coming through my mind, and I just want to dive deep. So I hope you'll indulge me today. I've got a ton of questions, and it's, about, it's just about the work you do, because I think it is so critical. So last time, Bishop, you said that you give us the example of a school called, I think, the Madison School, correct? Right. And you said that... Um, and you said that you guys were able to reduce um, the crime rate by 90%, and it was from an independent, you know, like um, um, uh, appraiser. So that number is huge. It is huge. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I can just sit there and imagine the, um, how much improvement can be brought to Black lives, as a matter of fact, if indeed you're able to create, you know, to, to have these type of results. So... To me, I can't think of a more important um, program than the one you're talking about. So please, um, by the way, when you talked about 90% inc increase in crime, can you describe to us a little bit more what, what you mean by crime? What's in those crimes? It is, we're talking homicides only and or theft or anything. C can you just at least give us an example? Give us yeah, an idea of what those, it, that crime is. Yeah, we called it youth predatory crime. That was where uh -huh. we... Yeah, so we were talking about those crimes that youth were doing to each other, the fightings, the, the, the jackings, the burglaries, the things that were predatory that were done by those young people. So that was the crime that we were targeting when we did this. And so having those OGs as the buffer between what I say is they created a pause. And when they created that pause, that pause is what gave us the kind of leverage to interject different thinking patterns, and those thinking patterns resulted into a peaceful environment. So, so how, tell us a little bit more about these OGs. So, because, you know, tell us, maybe walk some people through, because you, 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 you live in this world, you have a very good understanding of it, but for, I think for the rest of us who don't necessarily get to, you know, be in it all the time, I think it's important you explain to us what's going on. So how is it that 25 um, gang members, you know, like kids who are part of, um, you know, like maybe the part of gangs, I don't know, but you talked about the 25 troublemakers, and they were pretty much messing up everything at the school, right? How many, how many people are we talking about? at the school like 25 people were affecting how many people total approximately at, level, at that point it was 740 students okay and so a small school got it so help 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 the rest of us understand what how did it um 
how, what did it look like, you know, these 25 students, in which way and what was going on, how, what was going on in the community uh, with these 25 people in place without any intervention? What's going on? Walk us through all the troubles and everything that's going on. So the school was surrounded by the eight different neighborhoods. You know, mm -hmm. one of the issues in urban communities is you have highways and stuff. And those highways cut through the neighborhood. And so you had the, right. the, 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 the neighborhoods divided up into different sectors, you know. And so each one of them had their own gangs or their own neighborhoods that they represented. But the melting pot was the junior high school and the high schools, only two high schools in that area. One was Lincoln, one was Madison. And so when you were at the school, all of those ones that were having these social issues and the violent tendencies were all in that one school. So the school became the virtual rites of passage for those who wanted to prove their warriorship. It was like this was their manhood test. It was their, their opus to go through that. And so it was a history of gangs and violence as being the natural state of those neighborhoods. So you had Park Row, you had Four Dukes, you had South Side, you had HHP, you had 415, you had East Dallas, you had PGV, you had OCBF, you had PGO. See, all of these are gangs that were kind of in the midst of this. And then you had those who were in from prison gangs who were the older guys who were kind of directing the traffic. So, so these young people were trying to hold up that standard. So school became immaterial. It wasn't like school was the biggest deal. School was all right, but you were there to represent the neighborhood. And so, so we said, okay. And, and, and then that's so the school was plummeting in, in, in despair when it came down to grades and this and citizenship because how are you gonna have a basketball game or a football game in a stadium and that stadium is housed those kids plus all the ancillary folks who are part of the of the madness. So you had that kind of dynamic going on. And so our role so, was to stay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Before you before you before you go there, uh, Bishop. Also, so again, um, this is very this is very interesting to understand. So for the other 700, let's say you said 750 kids, but 25 are troublemakers. So for the other 725 kids. What does it mean? What does it mean for them? It means that they can't study. Why? It means that they can't feel safe. Why? What's life for them? Well, life is like a box of chocolate. No, I'm just fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. Life was uh, under siege. You know, you had to. You had to choose. So say, I'm gonna give you a basic example. Say if you were a pretty girl like you are, a pretty, pretty dark lady. You know, I got this, I got- You, you say, know, if I, you were, I heard that, I heard that, stop it. I got a song called Pretty Black Lady that I wrote. I'm, I'm gonna sing it, I'm gonna sing this song too. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna let you, I'm, I'm gonna let you and your husband take that on your own, just y'all can have that. And I wrote it though. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, look, no, uh -huh. so say if you're a young lady who is trying to figure out, man, um, I like this young man or this young man who likes this young lady, but they so happen to be from different sides of the neighborhood. And we're talking about how old, we're talking about how old approximately, 15, they're like 15, you know, 16, 17 year olds, uh, high school. Okay. Um, okay. And then you got these older guys who are saying, you know, we don't mess with that, uh, those whatever. And so you had this constant ebb and flow of, I don't know if I can be, I, you know, and then natural friendships became rivals and, and they became, you know, it's almost like they were competing with a narrative that they couldn't win because the narrative was be violent or be taken out. And so that wow. was the state of affairs. So, and so kids who were smart had to fake as if they were not, because to be smart means you, you are not down enough you you ain't you ain't hard enough, so you can't act like you're smart. So it was all those other dynamics because toughness and survival became the most prominent idea rather than being aware and all of that. So that was the dynamic. That was the real and dynamic. Then say, and, and then and then would you say that the same thing was happening also maybe inside the classroom? Because unfortunately, I feel too often um, you're in an environment, for example, where even to be good at math is considered to be playing. 
uh, not okay game in their mind uh, to speak properly, whatever that means, is to be looked as weakness, right? So is that is that so? Tell us a little bit more about the class, about the um, you know the academics itself. Like how was it yeah, affecting? I mean, what- there was there were there were brilliant students who had to uh, mold their brilliance into hustling, or uh, hustling meaning to uh, battle through a survival technique. And that was brilliant, rather than using their brilliance to solve math equations. Uh, they were given labels, which all kids get labels, but those labels had deadly consequences, like snitch, like this. like Those things were not taken lightly during that kind of moment because all of it is volatility at its highest level. So it's volatility that, that goes to, to it's a two, too hard, it's a too, um, too brash. And so that volatility would produce some harsh realities. So that's like, what- the chess, like, the like, chess. Like, like um, there were shootings, broad daylight. There were gang fights every day. There, you could every not day. ride on the bus without getting jumped on the bus. You would get jumped on the bus every day. You would, oh you would not be able to participate in any sports that had the different sides there. There was, um, there was this um, understood when the bell rung, it was the cattle call. It was like the cattle call or the, or the you know, it was, it, that's when everybody started coming out to their places of hiding and places and, and became, you know, real, um, and, and it was a lot of injury. Uh, there were people who were bringing guns and, and knives and all that to school for real because, and, and some who were not those type, but they were saying, either I do this or I am going to be a victim. So it was all of that. And it was, it was a very hostile environment. It was extremely hostile to the point where we were, um, we were saying that if they survived it, See, if a kid survived it, they would be tra- tra- uh, traumatized to the point where social, uh, where their social skills would have eroded. And so it would take them time. Because, see, childhood is about adventure. It's about right. possibility. And so when that right. possibility is capped with, there's a reality that you could get, you will be, yeah. you got to represent. That then closes your reality, your your possibility portal into only reality. See, watch this. I yes. tell people this. When your reality and your fantasy is the same, that's a dangerous place because you have yes. nowhere to go in your mind. So when you when you say, I fantasize about killing somebody or being killed, that's your fantasy. And then your reality is, I might have to kill somebody or get killed. See, that's a oh. dangerous because you don't have no wiggle room. So your brain is in this. So we had to say, what if I said college? What if I said business? What if I said no more fights? What if I said business owner? What if I said, see, we start, you start, and they say, well, how are we going to get it? Well, well, first we got to deal with this. Well, who's going to do it? Well, let us have these OGs deal with this. So then you can start being this. See? So, so Bishop, would you say then that at that point you have clearly identified that there is obviously what you would say, the nature of a problem you've you're identified at that right moment and what needs to be fixed. Would you once again stick with uh, your theory that you've identified that at that point, the culture is wrong? This microculture within the school, would you, would you say that that is what is wrong or do you call it something else? No, it was the cultural influences that, I'm gonna tell you something now. This is not me being political. I was a gang interventionist. So I worked with gangs trying to stop them from killing each other. That's what I did. I want, and this is a statement I want everyone to hear. And this is no indictment, this is just the truth. And I've, I've done hundreds of these. There was rarely a time when someone did a drive-by 
or something that was in that drive by when you drive by an area and you shoot it up, or something that was heinous that were that was gun and death induced, that they did not first listen to music. Interesting. Tell me more. Requisite. They would they would have to get high. They would listen to the music to get them in that zone. They would they would get themselves into that spirit of that moment. And then they would go, what they call, go do some dirt. You don't do dirt wow. when you're just in your right mind. So you have to, one of my mentors, Amr Rashidi, used to tell me, well, you have to demoralize and dehumanize. So I can't look at this. See, and, it, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to curse on here, but, you know, we have to say things. They have to say things that are so uh, heinous so that it dehumanizes who they looking at. So you not, man, man, that's the one her name may get, you know, that's that black woman, that's what, you know. And so they create names and words and ideas. So you ain't, you know, like if you was a crip, they would say, that's an E-Rick, if you was a blood, that's a slob, if you, they, they, you know, they would call these names out so that they could get into a mind. You know, we, we would say that we would, cur and then black kids would curse every, Feature that was inalienable their own. So they would say, you black, big nose, big lip, nappy head, nigga, I'm gonna kill you. See? So they would have to create an image. So they couldn't just say, I'm gonna kill you, John. See, because John, nah, that's, 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 and you know, he HAP, he represent that, you know, so that becomes where they live. And so to get them from that place, I have to replace that picture and say, no, nah, you know that, you know his name like John, right? You do know that. And you do know that John got a grandmother, right? They like go to the same church that your grandmama go to. Y'all you, you, know that, right? You, you know that y'all both have children that y'all try. So when you start unlayering this stuff, and then they start hearing things that reinforces an idea, that is a pause. See, the pause happens where you can't just react because you're in surviving, because I'm taking you up. I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm and you look and say, wait a minute. And I don't know if that's totally true. Even though I've been saying it like it's true, I don't know if that's really, really true as I thought it was. So it gets into these stages. And so that's when you, once you create that pause, you say, now let me interject something that is a lot more uh, uh, nuanced than what you had. So that's what we, that's that's what we do. I know it's a lot, but so, that's what we do. So, so Bishop, um... So, and to do that, you're relying on these people that you call the OGs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, please explain more um, to somebody who's never heard these terms before. What does OG mean? Why those two letter OG? Uh, who are they? Where do you find them? Why do you identify them as the ones who should be working with you? What do you tell them when you find them to come over? What's going, who are these people? An OG, the original term meant an original gangster. That was the original. Now we, you know, we, we say a lot of stuff now, but that's the, that's the original idea. It means original gangster. And what it means is someone who has the credibility and has the status of leadership inside of a gang organization. Okay. Uh, and so, um, that that group, those OGs, they kind of call the shots. Um, and there are levels. Like if you say you're a BG, a BG is like a baby gangster. That's like you. You're a baby gangster. And then I'm you a baby gangster. Okay, good. Yeah, you're a BG. <laughs> and then you have a you're wife. OG. You're yeah, OG. OG. Well, I'm under and I'm under good guidance, the OG of you. <laughs> and so you got a YG. And then you okay. have, and, uh, and that's like a young, and then you have uh, OG. And then you have what they call a triple stack OG, which is the, you know, and then in a gang, in the original gang language, see, it wasn't like, like I'm a blood, like you had sets, you know, you are, and then those sets had different, like, say if I'm a, say if I'm a Trey 5-7, I'm a Trey 5-7, IGC Crip. That means I'm an insane gangster Crip. Then you had Rolling Crip. Then you had Hoovers. Then you had, you know, and it was all, you know, Rolling Twins, or Rolling Six, or Rolling Thirty. Uh, you know, all of these things that had, and then if you were in the other side, like 
vice lords and gangster disciples and Latin kings and folks. And so you had nations. There was people nation and folk nation. And you had, so you had all of these things. And then you have prison gangs like Black Guerrilla Family and the, and the, uh, and the Mexican Mafia and the Texas Syndicate and the other time. You, all of these things. So you have all of these worlds that are very complicated worlds that most young people are not as sophisticated to understand the nuances of those worlds. They understand the basics, you know. I'm from that neighborhood, but they, you know. So I said, so basically, your your Section Eight voucher made you a gang. So if they gave you another Section Eight voucher and move you over there, what you gonna be, you know? <laughs> and so we would go into all of this, and I'm trying to explain to them that that is not how you choose a life choice, bro, based on where you so happen to wake up. And but as a survivalist, you say, no, that is a very smart thing for me to do, sir because I don't want to get killed. So I'm in. And so whatever that I'm in means, then I'm in. And, and so you had all of those kind of orders that happen. So the OG is the one that creates the rules or really maintain or create. They maintain those rules so that these youngsters will follow. So there is, so, so I spent a whole lot of time teaching young people how to be a gang member before I got them out. Because you got to teach a person that they are wrong so that they can understand the wrong. See? So wait a second. Wait, 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 Bishop. Wait, wait, wait. Pause, 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 pause. What did I hear you say? That you have to first teach them how to be a gang member before you teach them how to get out? Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah, because I'm sure so. So, man, yeah. If I say to you, who is your OG? I ain't got no OG, I'm my own OG, okay? Well, who you represent? I represent my mama, okay? Uh, well, what hood you in? Well, I'm from, I'm from Piru, whatever hood you say. I'm from East Dallas, whatever hood you say. I'm from the South Side. All right. So look, man, you can have your own gang call you but that does not give you the backing of the gang if you ain't an OG, you don't represent the set. I would say, do you have any knowledge of the set? Like where did the set come from? What's the, what's the symbols mean? What you mean when you rolling? How you get your tear drop? What kind of work did you put in? Who put you down? What was so I would ask all of these investigative questions and most of them be like, well, bro, you know, one of them dudes killed my brother. I said, well, you mad at the dude that killed your brother? You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't be mad at the whole world and then created a whole nother situation. You you can't, you know, it's like me say, I don't like America, so I'm I'm from America 2.0, bruh. But now you can't, <laughs> <laughs> that don't work like that. You can't say, I, you know, no, you have the whole rules to this. Now let me explain yes. the rules. Let me explain how the rules go. Let me explain the consequences. Let me explain the hierarchy. And then let me say, are you, do you feel qualified to make that decision? And if you still qualified, then let's go. Let's start making decisions based on that information that I just told you. So here's the first decision. It's 20 degrees below zero. You a crip, so you hate red. 20 degrees below zero, someone drops you off in Alaska. You are walking, it's 20 degrees below zero. Your feet are frozen, you are gonna die. You walk up on a red mink coat with all kinds of warmth in it, and you say, I vow to hate red for the rest of my life. Do you put the coat on or do you keep walking because you hate red, man? Those are the rules. See, the rules say you don't do nothing with red. So do you hate it or do you put the coat on? So, man, so I'm gonna put the coat on. Well, wait a minute. Well, hold on, hold on. Okay. I am, I'm so, here. Yeah, so so let's talk. So you ain't as committed as you, no, I'm committed. You just put me in the, I said, well, okay, let's try, let's try this. Your mama got on red and it is an order to shoot your mama because she has, she is disrespecting your set by wearing red in your neighborhood and you a crip, so you ain't, so what you gonna do? Who killing mama? Hold on, sir. You, you taking it too far? No, you taking it too far. I'm, I'm saying, how far are we gonna take it? So if we ain't taking it, so then let's try something. See, so when you start having them kind of discussions, your mind starts saying, wait a minute, man. Oh, hold on, hold on. And then the OGs will say, well, man, I wouldn't even tell him to do that. I said, okay, well, so if you the OG, can I explain to you how to lead? Because when I was doing this in prison, I would say, are you trying to lead them to stay in prison? Is this the role? No, no, sir, my goal is to get them out. Wherever you're gonna get them out, 
don't you need a pathway to get them out? You can't get them out by guessing. So let me help you get them out. But once they start finding their way out of prison, other prison cells in here start opening up. And so you start saying, not only am I, am I getting out of prison, I'm getting out of this prison mentality. I'm getting out of this. Man, why, dude, why are we doing this? I don't even know this dude. Why, why, why am I, you know, what's the, you know? And so it becomes this whole nother thing. So that's how you start this process. And it's not easy because certain things are entrenched. See, let me show you something. The only way you battle belief is you have to make truth so undeniable that belief has to submit to it. True. But so some people believe that a rabbit's foot is lucky until you say, you know that rabbit did get his foot cut off. <laughs> say, oh, you know, yeah, I might not be that lucky then, you know. <laughs> I don't spit the pole when I walk, you know. I eat black eyed peas, that's their belief. I mean, I believe that. And the only way you can break up someone's belief is to give them real, unfiltered, raw truth. And say, now I'm gonna give you this truth, but I'm gonna give it to you in pieces to where the more truth you eat, the scripture says it like this, the more you know truth, the freer you become. And as you become freer and freer and freer, you start saying, that's a lie. I don't never tell you it's a lie. I'm just giving you truth. You can compare the truth to your belief and see what do it hold up. And if it don't hold up, we're gonna have to start giving you some different belief system. And then we impose a new belief system. Let's say maybe you have leadership and you're a warrior, but maybe you have chosen the wrong fight. And maybe you are leading the wrong fight. This is very interesting. So, so. Understanding, I, thanks Bishop for walking um, people who might be listening to us and who might not have any idea of the world we're talking about. And I'm hoping also that as they're hearing us talk, they're starting to understand why and what do we mean by culture matters because they can see that this is very, and you know, um, this type of environment is very different from, <laughs> you know, the one that they might be in. But in any case, um, so, these, there are these 25 kids. This is the world in which they are. Each one of them feels that they represent, you know, their one of the eight neighborhoods surrounding this one school where eight neighborhoods that hate each, seem to not get along with each other have to artificially meet at, you know, converge at because that's where the school is. And all of a sudden, you're, the school is bringing enemies together, in a way, uh, forcing them to be together. Um, 25 of them are the bigger representatives of, of this reality. And so the school, obviously, there's are big issues. And then they call you in with urban specialists. So you go, where do you recruit one OG? Do you recruit an OG from each of the neighborhoods represented in that school? Are these OGs people who are still active gangsters or have they, have they vowed to live a life of redemption and this is how, you know, they're going forward? What's... Well, they are, here is the, uh, certain OGs have not vowed to become positive. Mm -hmm. They are just character coaches and if the goal is to improve that coach i have to deal with where they are some yeah, of them, the people who have an influence yes yeah, so I, you know i told i tell people all the time if if the influences influences were bakers my shirt would be full of flour i just so happen to have need ogs you know and so so now, where do you find them? Yeah, you got to, so, so we call it, uh, our methodology is called 3I, okay? So 3I means intrusion, invasion, and institute. So one of the things, and that is the model that we use, and I made that up, so if you, so if anybody take that, I got some OGs that's gonna come get you, you know? It's called 3I. <laughs> and so it's intrusion, invasion, and institute. So- Institute? Yeah, institute. So one of the I's is invasion, uh, intrusion, an intrusion, we say that you have to get very close to the client to do proper diagnosis. You cannot do drive-by analysis of these complicated issues. So the way you find OGs is you got to get very close to those who are experiencing the pain. 
so you can see the nuances of who is in leadership, who is this, what is that. You can't just, you got to get in there. So you can't be afraid of the environment. You can't hate the client. And you cannot villainize who they have called heroes. You got to make the hero the hero. See, it's like this movie. Have you ever saw the movie Hancock? You ain't saw Hancock, have you? I heard about Hancock? it, but no. Nope. You didn't look at Hancock. Something to do? I will. Hancock I will. I will. I will check it out. Smith, who is a hero, but he is a drunk, and he just, he's a horrible hero. And this guy mm. decided to make him the right kind of hero. It was tough. Uh, it was tough. Uh, but, but see, so when I see these guys, number one, I tell them, I'm not going to judge you for who you were based on your record, because every one of us got a record. It's a record of somebody who don't like all of us. I tell them, you know, if I have, if, if my ex, you know, they say, well, Bruce Roman's a great guy. Say, yeah, well, I know him, you know. <laughs> you know. So everyone has a record that will, that will, that will kind of challenge your, your, so I don't judge them on, I'm judging on your character because your characteristic has a market advantage. Only thing I need to do is help shape your character because if you could be that person like 65, like in Dallas, 65% of the population is South, only 15% of development is South. And the excuse used is crime violence. If you were the one who could solve crime violence, you could then attract the 65% of that business that's outside of that neighborhood. And you would be the gatekeeper or the whatever because you got the credibility. But can I show you how to get your character to where you can make that negotiation yourself? Can I show you how to use? So that is the appeal to the OG. And then those OGs will say, man, normally it was thrust upon them because of violence and other things. Most OGs, real OGs are not getting up trying to uh, become that. They, they have innate leadership ability that they've just used in uh, a difficult way to handle difficult situations. I'm giving you a whole lot of this stuff now. Look, you you gonna pay me for this? No, no, no. This is very interesting. This is very important to me. So, so again, for these 25 kids, you are you going after? Ex what did you say? Are you paying me for this? Oh, come on, Bishop. You know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to really. I think you're doing one of the most important work there is to be done out there, and I really want. Um, for folks to understand that, because once we do, I think there's going to be so much more, you know, resources that can come to help us, you know, make sure that we can, you know, multiply this work and white go faster. And say, ago, white man told me that 400 years ago, still ain't gave me my four acres. In <laughs> you're so, you're, okay, Bishop. Okay, let's, let's go back to our... <laughs> <laughs> You're so good at derailing us all the time. So, so these OGs. So, in a situation like this, you're you're getting one OG, two OGs. How does how do you determine how many OGs you need? Does it matter, or and then what happens? The kid, and then where do they do the work? Where do they do the work at the school in the street, or do they? Because I know you have a university. There's a location where you are. You have um you have a building where I have seen like you know like almost like a place where people can come together, they can do some presentations. I mean, yes, again, you have, I'm trying for you to make it, to make this, to walk us through this, because so many people That's have given the, up. And on yeah. one end, and on one end, I have Candy saying, oh, there's no problem. Everything is okay. If, if just white people stop being racist, none of this is going to be there. I, I have, I don't believe that. What you explain, what you're talking to me right now, you know, it doesn't matter that the rest of the world are a bunch of saints. It seems like what's going on is still going on. So this yeah. is now, it's, we're, we're among ourselves here. You know, we're among ourselves. So what you're saying, and, and I want to understand this. So for people to say there's nothing you can do or they feel overwhelmed. And clearly you're like, no, I mean, we're, we got this. So let's make it even more real for them. So the OGs are okay. there. So what happens? Yeah. You, you recruit so, so, them. Okay, so, so you get, so depending on the area. Like we're doing a 90 day OG invasion of four neighborhoods in Dallas over the next 90 days, literally over this next 90 days. What does that mean? That means that for 90 days, we will engage higher 25 OGs. Some at, some at full time, some at part time, some at, and we, and we, and that's what we mean by invasion. So I told you it's three I. 
intrusive from yes. it. So you got to invade a community. So we are saying to those OGs to do four different things. One, they're going to meet with those other young, uh, violent, interruptive guys and say, all right, man, this is what we're going to do. We, we will meet with you weekly so that we can diffuse any potential predatory issues that's happening. Because most of these young people just want to tense the anyway. So, so, it's, so it's mentorship. See, this is what we found out. And I'm going to tell you something about OGU in a minute, too. See, we found out that there are three things that perpetuate a violent community, beyond gangs and all that. It is economics, it is mentorship, and it is education. Those three things. When those three things are missing consistently, you have this kind of eruption. So we say, all right, if we can create uh, the mentor part through these OGs, they become a part of the conversations in the neighborhoods. So they literally become interventionists. And we train them how to do that. Then, and then, so they have caseloads the whole nine. Because they are, they, they, that's their role. Their role is to protect. And then... They meet with those resident institutions, remember, institute. So they meet with the institutions in those neighborhoods that are that are stakeholders, like businesses, schools, uh, you know, restaurants, you know, candy houses, whatever, all of those things that are the institutional framework of those neighborhoods, they become the representatives and say, we want to be the interpreters for you so that those who have been doing these acts of violence and crime can have a different perspective of who you are. Because now they have become this interpreter for those neighborhood you know, risk takers. And then we say, you have to have a program. So we take them through a program called Benefits and Consequences, which is a 12 week program that I wrote again, so don't try to take it. It's a 12 week program called Benefits and Consequences. And that 12 week program walks them through how to come from being this isolated person into citizenship. And once we get them through that 12 week program, those, those young people or those older people, they, they then are able to model mentor you know, because it's relational. See, it is a relational way that you do this. So that's what it means to have that kind of deal. So we train OGs to do what I am saying. And, and then in certain cases, we do it ourselves. Like for 90 days in Dallas, we're going to do it ourselves. I'm, 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 so we can keep the demonstration, so because keep, we have to keep demonstrating that this works. See, I, I've been doing it so long. The reason I talk like this, because I've done it a hundred times, and I know it works every time. You know, it's, it's almost like, you know, someone who says, there is no cure for this. And then you say, no, nah, every time I take this, it works. Well, I don't believe it. I'm sorry if you don't believe it's the truth. So that's, like, that's where I'm at. You know, I know that this works because I've done it. I've seen it. I felt no, it. No, this is this is fascinating, Bishop. So um, we're getting towards the end of our session today, but um, I want you to walk us through a few, um, few a couple examples, and I want you to try and think about the hardest um, situations that mm -hmm. you had to walk into. Um, I would like for you to share a story of the hardest OG maybe you had to deal with. Yep, and in that okay. case, did you end up did it end up working or not? Uh, the hardest neighborhood or situation that you had to deal with, and did you ever did you ever lose? Did you ever lose? Did yeah. it ever? Um, what happens when in those situations? Hardest OG I ever worked with Maggie. No. <laughs> the, hardest OG, the, <laughs> the hardest OG. What have I done again or not done? <laughs> <laughs> she said, "You be on time, are you?" But now the yeah, hardest yeah. OG. Uh, is this young man, he's very racial, like extremely racial. When he came into my group- Racial meaning racist? Yeah, he was extremely racist. He said it was his Against, 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 a, against a, a white, a black person against, yeah, who no, is it? it? Hispanic against black. He okay. walked into our group, cause we had this group, we have a group called the Yamoja Council. It's a, uh, uh, you know, African word for unity. So we always have a emoji council where all of, you know, the OGs get together. That's where we meet once a week to, you know. And so he walked into the emoji council. He said, let me just be very clear. And this is his exact words. And this is 12 of the roughest gangsters I know. I am tensing up because I feel like I know what he said. Go yeah. ahead. He looked around the group and said, I want you to, I want to be clear to all of y'all. I hate niggas. 
Wow. And if it were up to me, I would kill you now. My wow. family is mafia and we hate y'all. There's nothing that you can say to me that could make me understand you, love you. So I don't know why they got me in this program, but I don't care. I'll do it because it's part of my um, sentence. But I'm telling you now that if any of you ever is along with me, please understand that my goal would be to take your life. That's how much I hate y'all. Wow. That's a, that and all based on race. Name. Nothing that else was, but race, based on race. Yeah, I mean, you know, and he, you know, his gang, he, he had, a, you know, his gang yeah. was, you know, I ain't gonna say the name of his gang was, but his gang was based on that, and that's how they were, and it was a prison gang, so that was their motto, I never get it, and so, you know, the gang, you know, and now we have a code of conduct in our meetings, code of conduct is certain things you can't say, certain this, certain that, yeah. so we have a code, so they, so they saying to me, say, sir, he breaking the code, you know, and I'm saying, it's his first day. They were like, it's going to be his last day, you know. And so the brothers are getting, you know, it's getting tense, and, you know, and this dude is, and he's smiling. He's saying, I know. He said, you can beat me up every day. It doesn't matter because I, I will find out. You know, it was just very weird. Anyway, um, long story short, when he left, he we had to go back to San Pablo. He wrote me the most beautiful poem and A said, poem. And, and, that he wrote a poem, I couldn't believe it. I think they, I just, I, I don't know where I can find, but I believe they put that poem. He wrote a poem and it was talking about a flower, how a flower buds and how he had to come to a place of sunlight. And he found that sunlight wow. in the darkest place in the most, maybe it was the most moving thing. And he came and he gave me a hug in front of all of them and said to, to all of you brothers, I offended at the beginning. I feel like y'all my brothers at the end. He was like, I'm, I have to go back to my family. And, and I don't know how I'm a, how this is gonna happen, but but man, I never forget that. That was that was the most move. And you know, you had gangsters trying to look tough, but they was trying not to cry. I said, yeah, I know y'all, you know, because it was cause <laughs> it was real, you know. And and uh, right. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get another story that's funny. This one guy, he was he was the most intelligent guy I've ever met that was incarcerated. His name was Eric. Never forget. And so Eric, but Eric was smart, but he was, he was, he was, he was a gangster for real, but he was smart and he was intelligent. And so well, they had him in solitary confinement and he had his shirt off, he had his hands wrapped and he was hitting the, 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 the solitary, you know, boom, boom, boom. He said, anyone who says anything to me today, I promise I'm knocking them out or they're going to kill me in this day. I'm going to hurt somebody today. If you say hi to me, if you say hello, you know. And so I was coming into work and I had my backpack and I walked in. I said, what's going on? He was like, man, because Eric and I had a good relationship, you know. They said, man, Eric. And he was like, I'm t I am put it on my life. Anybody say something? So I said, Eric, man, what's going on? <laughs> he, said, he, looked, he said, why would you do that, man? <laughs> He said, oh my oh, God. come speak to me, man. I just told the whole world I'm going to kill people. And then to to me. Me. I said, I didn't think you were talking about me, man. I thought you were talking about them. He said, man, come on, man. Let me talk. He said, Lord, he said, I'm so tired of this guy. You know, and we both started laughing because it was it was just such a weird moment. It was, But he was like, if anybody say anything, I'm killing them. You know, and I was like, so, hey, man, what's up? He said, Omar, Mr. Omar. Why would you do that when I just told the whole world and I got my shirt off and then you in here talking about what's wrong? I said, I didn't think you were talking about me. I thought you were talking about me. I didn't know. Uh, I've had so many stories like that. But now in some neighborhoods, man, I've been in some neighborhoods. I never forget I was down south and it was two gangs uh, and it was right at the border of Mexico. And I did a big gang intervention with all of these Hispanics, man. It was, it was a big deal. And me and these guys, I brought some guys, I, I got some guys who furloughed from the prison to come with me. They was on furlough. And it's, and, and so we was meeting with all these gang guys and and so trying to get them to have peace because it was, it was you know, right across the border. And so they went and it was three little girls who was in our group because we were talking to the kids about, you gonna stay alive? Say, I'm gonna stay alive, you know, was, you know. And so they was like, uh. yeah, we're going to go back. And I said, okay. So they left and they came back with their cousins. And all of these dudes had them long beards and them hats and, and they had chains and they was dragging the chains, looking at us and popping them on the concrete with the spark flying. Oh my. And, and them long oh my poles. God. And walking was like, where are they? 
and they was pointing at us, and I'm looking. And so my guys who were from prison, Juan and Alex, they took their shirts off. You know, I said, put your shirt on, man, before we get killed out of it. And uh, I'm like, <laughs> so, and there's a lot of them too, man. And so we stood there like that with our hands up. And man, I I knew I could speak then because I talked for my life that day. I was like, listen, brothers, we are not trying to harm nor disrupt whatever you got going on. Our job is to keep your nieces alive. Even if you got to go to war, don't you want to at least have a seed in the ground that can grow to his highest potential? The dude was looking the older guy. You know, he told this guy, put the, you know, put the dude, other dude was popping the chain. And I'm like, oh. I said, can you stop Frankenstein? You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I said, can you stop Frankenstein from popping the chain, please? Because I'm nervous, man. I got my hands up. Obviously, we don't want nothing. And my boys, you know, they looking. I was like, put your hands up. They're like, man. I said, put your hands up. I said, so these guys, they are in prison. But we are all saying that this is not, you know, we're gonna, he was like, he told the kids, he said, y'all can go, you know, y'all can go. And, and they was like, and the kids was like, sorry, but we had to tell them, you know, I said, I understand, you know, because it was more familiar, you know, fam, you know, in the uh, Latino gangs is more family. You know, I dealt with Asian gangs. I dealt with Aryan nation. I dealt with everybody. So I understand how it looks. See, that's why I don't get really intimidated when I hear people talking, you know, on, Twitter and Facebook and that, you know, I'm like, yeah. It, but that is not as scary as knowing that someone has the capacity, the ability and the willingness to go all the way to death. I had one guy who shot himself in the head because he put it on his gang that he would. So he had a bullet, 25 bullets stuck in his brain. And uh, he was, he was, he was, he was uh, uh, you know, that was, that was tough. But I'm saying I've had all of these scenarios that, 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 that formulates in my mind two things, that they are fearless and they are needed. And once they understand their need and, and match their need with their intelligence, their fearlessness makes them the perfect allies to what you want when you want to restore community. Because you need people who are not afraid of the environment and who are willing to tackle those things that other people are afraid of. That's what they are. So that's why I stick in that lane so much. You know, I ain't talking for a long time. You know, so no, you know, I mean you my no, this is amazing. You are my you are my <laughs> therapist. I need this. You, you, yeah, no, I <laughs> no, but Bishop, you know, what I find what I find fascinating with the work you do is mm, Maybe some people who are listening to us might feel like, oh, it's hopeless. Oh, my God. I mean, this, this level of violence he's talking about, this level of, um, you know, brokenness in human beings that he's talking about. And also, you know, uh, what, what, where do we go with you? But it seems to me that you've developed a very, um, a very strategic way to almost um, bring back sanity to some of these neighborhoods. It's almost like block by block by block. Right? It's, it seems to me like you're going yeah. at it block by block. It's not like, you know, you're right. not dealing with isolated agents here and there. You're, you're really working very much. In, would you say that that's how you do it? You, you clean up, a, you, if, we can use it, if we can say that word, but you heal a block, you heal a community block by block, but you don't quit right. until the community is healed within that block. So that, you know, it's not like, you know, you just cleaned up, you leave, it goes back to craziness. Would you say that that's how you do it? That once you've dealt with one community in a, in a neighborhood, you usually do, do not have to go back there. You can continue on to the next. Is that what you would say? Or Absolutely does it right. feel like an eternal starting no, over in the no, same no. place? See, see, no, that's a very good, that's a very good question. See, this is what people need to understand. Transformation is real. Redemption is real. People truly do advance and evolve and, re, and, re, and recalibrate. And I'm gonna tell you something. Information is a equalizer. That's so why I said the scripture mm. says truth makes you free. When you, when you are informed, it's hard for you to be what you were because you're not that anymore. You know, you're not that. You know, when you used to be the party girl at all them clubs and stuff, I got pictures. When you used to be that. What are you talking? What? Bishop, what are you talking? <laughs> Whatever. Okay, go on. I was, I was, I was young. 
I was young, you know, we're all young, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know you <laughs> when you were a young person. <laughs> that was you can't you can't actively be that now. That that was that would make you 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 your brain is gonna say meetings. It's true. I, I should say I know too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a place of no return. <laughs> I'm the bishop of the country. I know. <laughs> so it is like that, man. So once a person, and, then, and so when they have phased out of that moment and they recognize, and then they still young, say just 23, 24, 25, and then they say, man, I have created a lifetime of enemies, problems, felonies, blah, blah, blah. And now I do what with this? So I've become a dope dealer. I've become, you know, it, it, it just becomes this kind of irrational. What's my cycle? What's my life cycle? And then someone like me says, hey man, hey, can I show you something? That guy right there is trying to build a house right here, but he's afraid of them right there and you are not. Can you help that guy? And if you help that guy, that guy will give you access. That's all I gotta do, just be me. Yeah, that's your gift right now. And then they start discovering, you know, and then I used to be an architect. Well, did you know that that guy right there is trying to find young architects that he can point to? Yeah, okay, yeah. And then, I, you know, and then it becomes this cornucopia of ideas that just speak, because see, when the human spirit is free, it becomes unstoppable. Mm -hmm. It's just free indeed. You are no longer mm -hmm. bound by what you were. So it's that, so, so it is, it's, it's, it's our will. It's the, it's, do we have the will to truly say we want to transform and change it? Because we have the way. I can show you the ways. Do we have the will? So I love that you all really exposed them what this looks like. I've never had anyone to ask me all these questions at this level. I'm, I'm serious. Out of 20 something years. No, but it's, uh, no, but this, it's because I think it's, I, I find it fascinating, Bishop. We're here. I, I, I have to say, in this country, so many people feel like, a, most people that I know who, who are aware even of these issues are kind of flat out scared to go anywhere near it, right? And, um, and then beyond that, I think, I, I really think that whether people say it or not, so many of them think it's a hopeless, hopeless case. Um, some, you know, some still think it's hopeless, but they throw money at whatever initiatives. And so for me, when we, disc when we, when we met you and when we got to understand what you do, for me, this understanding that, wow, Bishop Omar is able to clean communities one neighborhood at a time. And whenever he's done, whenever he's done healing a neighborhood, bringing it back on its feet, he never has to look back. He just needs to continue. And I feel like we could be doing this with all of America. And if we put the resources behind you, my goodness, this could be over. And also what I like is, you know, um, so many people are scared to get involved with any of this because they're like, oh, could I be the, the recipient of the violence from these gangsters and all of that? And I, I see you, I mean, even me, it's just, this is what I think I need. I, I don't think anyone... I would challenge most people listening, and I think almost no one knows that there is such an initiative that has such results. And that's why, and yeah, so, so that's, um, it's, rather, it's rather crazy. So Bishop, how, when did, you, when did you ever find out? When did you ever put two and two together? Why, why did you never sit there and do exactly what the two major camps do when it comes to these issues? Because remember when we talked about it, one camp says, oh, if you guys just, you know, work harder. These are like, you know, usually the people on the conservative side, just work harder. And, you know, I almost have no patience for your nonsense. So that's one group that says that. And we can see why these people would not connect, right, with, with that work harder. And also it pisses off other black people. It pisses off other people in, you know, in minorities. Because, and then the other side of the spectrum is, oh, yeah, obviously, bunch of bunch of um, what do you call it? Bunch of uh, you know, in France they would say, "Oh, these are the, these are the bottom of uh, of a condom." You know, <laughs> that's what that's how the French would talk about. That's almost like a genetic thing. Like you know, these are these are you know, like they're not even humans. That's more like the racist part. Um, and then, but but beyond that, you have uh, the truly just people who say. It's all racism. So why did you, when, why did you never fall into one of those categories? Obviously the one that said, 
as experience because the inferior folks, I, I understand why you would never think that because you're, you're not like that. But why did you never make it so easy as to get your life back together? And, but on the other end, also like so many others, you didn't just sit there and baby them all the way through by just saying, poor babies, it's not their fault. It's all due to racism. Why did you never fall for one of those, you know, extremes yet you, what made you realize that the, the culture is a problem? When did that happen for you? When was it, was it always like that? Or did you used to belong to one of those categories of people who say it's all racism or you black people shut up and get to work? You know, <laughs> it, it was it was a true uh, awakening. The first stages, I think when I was very young, I probably thought race was a primary. And then... Oh, so you used to think race was, was... You used to think that race was... Race and racism yeah, was yeah. the main... Yeah, I used to think that, you know, I used to say, you know, I used to go into this thing, man, I, and I would. And then what happened was the guys started challenging me on that. The guys would Who? say. What guys? The OGs. They would say, sir, I appreciate what you're saying, but, and they would go into scenario after scenario where it was not a race issue that brought them, you know, they would, they, and they, you know, they would acknowledge the structural stuff. They would acknowledge that, but they would also start going into a, um, a warrior mode that says, man, we look for the fight, not look for the fault. Interesting. And so that made me have to stop using the fault as the fight. Because if you only have the fault, then you start losing your fight. So they said, what the fight at, man? You know, we good, okay, cool. So that didn't move them, you know, that was because I was trying to move their spirits. And what moved their spirits was stuff like, who are you? What moved their spirits is historical context and blah, blah, blah. But they they were not moved by saying that the oppressive society would not allow us to get up. So that, 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 that don't move that, that no, no. What they would say is, I'm going to be honest about an oppressive society and speak to that. But they have moral, see, see the, the code in the gang, in a gangster community for real, the code in the gangster community is real men stand alone. That's the code. Uh, and it's not gender specific. Meaning you got to stand on it. So in other words, if you do that crime, you don't hide and act like you didn't do that. that, that you did that. You take that. You, you so so yeah so they will be but so they got the moral consistency though inside of that deal so they they would be just as angry at say man you just shot a little kid as it is that you just did a white collar crime or you just did a see for them it's moral consistency and it acknowledges it but it acknowledges it at the scale that it should be acknowledged they don't say that's a weighted scale, so I'm a weighted, 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 weighted. So no, they, they acknowledge it at the weight that it should be acknowledged. So Bishop, you're telling us that even people who are in the system and uh, the people who are the most affected, uh, the, the, um, you know, this, in a way, they don't even... So whoever on one end thinks it's just about working harder or on the other end thinks it's about because of racism, you're saying that the OGs themselves in this world themselves, actually <laughs> for them race, they're not saying that it's, it's racism is not a factor, but it's not, it doesn't change and it doesn't look like it changes much in, in that, that's not uh, I mean, a they, concern they, of they, theirs. Yeah, they think, that, they think that it is, you said it, it is a factor. It is a not factor, but not factor. the, but not the factor. Right, but it is a factor, and that's how you have I, to look at it. And so, and that's a real thing. And so they say, okay. And then even if it, even if even when it has the structural multiplicity, they'll say structural racism is a factor. And I suggest all 
uh, police brutality is a factor in a, all, blah, blah, blah. But they also say our moral responsibility is a factor. Our disconnect with our historical roots is a factor. Our uh, lack of ability to maneuver out of a survival mode is a factor. Just, so they start going into, see, when you start, when your spirit gets free, you can be free in a persecution-based society. See, because Absolutely. your spirit is free. Your, your yes. mind and your ideas are free. So you don't you don't have to become you don't have to become a slave to any in a system that is oppressive. You can always say and you can challenge it at its core and and and, and still and still have enough gravitas to say it it ain't controlling me, even though I'm 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 giving it my best shot at controlling it or moving through it or maneuvering. You know, we again we say no matter what happens to you. You are responsible for what you do for you. We truly say that. No matter what has um, happened to you, brother, you are responsible for what you do for you. So we can't talk about our daddy issues. And uh, man, we get it. And it's real and it's true. And it, bro, we, what we gonna do, man? You know, and so this is how you have to have that kind of true discussion when you're really trying to do this, the work that I do, because it frees you from narratives and just lets you deal in straight truth. So when you see a truth that's uncomfortable, it's an uncomfortable truth. But real so men true. stand on it. You got to stand on that thing. And it, you know, and it gets people, you know, and it, 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 it creates, it, it creates uh, courageous, bold ideas that some people like, some people don't, some people, you know, but it is what it is. See, that's how you have to keep purifying your truth. And you got to take it through the litmus test, and it, and it, and that's what makes it work. Because when you don't do that, it then takes it just a little bit off, and that's when you start getting into these other things, and that's the difference. But see, when you're around these people so much, you got to stay vulnerable. So you got to keep opening your heart. You got to keep opening your heart, because it is what that's it is. Well, Bishop, um, you know what I think of this work, and I'm so glad that more people, that you were willing to share more with us so that um, the, 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 you know, those listening to us today could have a little bit of a glance into the work you do and how it works, and uh, I hope it brought uh, so much more hope. Wait, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Who gave you those roses? Michael gave you those roses? I need to know that. Who gave you those roses? <laughs> Michael can do that because Michael didn't do that. Um, we don't have an issue. Yeah. <laughs> Give you that now. I'm gonna call Michael after the show. I'm, I'm, I got my call. No, no. I mean it. it is, so, I'll, I'll tell you. What is it? I'll tell you when we're done. I'll tell you when we're done. I'll give you my secrets. When we, I don't want to share. Call, call him. Say, say, man. <laughs> she on here. She got yellow. On, she smiling, looking pretty. Okay, and then somebody said, "I'm gonna call Mike." I'm calling Mike soon. This. Uh, uh, Michael I Carl thought you were my friend. I thought you were my friend, uh, Bishop. I thought you were my brother, but it seems like you're more a brother to Michael than to me, but it's okay. It's okay. It's all cool. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. You're about to rat me out. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Bishop, you are incorrigible. But, uh, you know, you're incorrigible, but the reason I love you still is because, man, um, the work you do, you are my hope, Bishop. You are my hope when it comes to these issues. Um, you know, being with you, it's just like, it always feels like everything is possible. Um, I, I sincerely, I, I've, the, the, the type of issue that you're fixing in this country is, um, uh, yeah, I think it's one of the biggest ones. And uh, you're doing it with such grace and always, it's, it's just a joy. Whenever I know that I'm going to be connecting with you, just to hear your name makes me, gives me a big smile. I'm laughing. I'm not just happy. It's just like, it's just, it's just, I don't know, and, and no wonder if the way you approach things in life, and I love um, the, no, the no guilt attitude, the no we're going to blame things, and, the no, and also the reality of, yes, the, it is true, so there's, race might be a factor, but um, we, have such, we can do so much more. So I love it. So thanks for sharing with us today, and um, I'm sure this is going to be prompting so much more. I have some surprises for you next, uh, on our next session, which is going to be when? Monday, right? So... Monday. Well, yes. So to those of you listening to us, this is uh, Black, the Black Culture Matters podcast brought to you by Catch the Drip uh, with Magad and Bishop Omar. Um, 
It is a video show we host together where cultural icons of our times get to inspire young Black people, our young Black listeners, to become the best versions of themselves, leading healthy, happy, and productive lives as co-creators of society by giving them the instructions and the knowledge they need to succeed. So you can find us on all the social media platforms with the handle at Catch the Drip TV. Um, Bishop, as usual, such a pleasure. I am going to wish you a really great weekend and uh, can't wait to see you next week. I, I really love digging deep into all of this and thank you for allowing us to walk into your shoes and to see through your eyes or should I say through your glasses? I don't know. I, I yet have to see your eyes, Bishop. But in any case, that's for a whole other podcast one day. <laughs> Guys, you have to know, I do not know what color Bishop's eyes are. It's a good thing that he's black. So most black people have the same eye color, but still we have some variation. I still have to discover his. Maybe at the end, you will show me. I will show you when this is over. I'm gonna do it. It's gonna be like Dark Vader taking his mask off. <laughs> that works. That works. Anything, Bishop? Anything before we part from the weekend? I love you. I love you. I love your spirit. I really love you. You, my sister. I mean it. You are a light. I love your passion. I love who you are. So we 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 get that. We are gonna get that. Love you. Love you too, Bishop. Love you. Bye. Have a great weekend. All right. Peace. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye.